ever wearing a bra again. There's a Channel 4 recorded information line that looks at the health effects of wearing or not wearing a bra. The number to call is 0870 400 2235. Lines are open around the clock and calls cost no more than 8 pence a minute. That's 0870 400 2235. and show those things to the world. <laughs> it's just horrendous. Show me. I look like my grandma. Oh, my God. <laughs> Look at so pretty. The show that will improve your life as well as your wardrobe. She's got to have it. Fridays at 8.30 on 4. Investigating a possible miscarriage of justice next on four. Love and war, passion and a fatal accident. But was it really murder? Trial and error in a couple of minutes. Call now on 09069 100 600 for a live one-to-one -one chat. 09069 100 600. How can you buy our best drinks for less this Christmas? With a little as the magic. Discover lower priced wines like the International White Wine of the Year for under £5. Save even more on your favourite spirits. Wish you'd lower the price of this 24 pack. Easy. There's exactly what you fancy for less than you'd expect. That's as the price. It's magic. The internet is a new world full of opportunities. Ow. But within this world, you could feel out of place. With MSN, however, you'll feel more at home. You can access a range of services, like email, shopping, and search from just one personal site. MSN, make it your home. On a distant planet, a life form lives in darkness. You don't know what's out there. <laughs> Only the light can save you. But light is running out. You're not afraid of the dark, are you? <laughs> Pitch Black. The first time we saw this, we were appalled. And the second time. And the third. But after a while, familiarity dulls the shock. So now you might think you couldn't be surprised by events in Africa. But what if you heard that the charities you gave money to had been duped? Or that millions of Africans are giving up on their continent and heading for Europe? In a new season, Channel 4 reveals the real state of Africa. Soria Samora follows the migration trail, where lives are lost every day in a bid to leave a shattered continent. And the truth about the role of the aid agencies is revealed in The Hunger Business. I will shake hands with the devil if I can get to the devil's victims and help them. Who'll Save Africa? A new season of program starts with The Hunger Business, Saturday at 8 on 4. Now on for trial and error, an investigation into a suspicious drowning. Was it calculated murder or was it the tragic result of a car accident? Day of Dollar, epitome of 80s cool and new wave fashion, enjoyed 10 consecutive hits in four years, commanding 20 grand just to have his picture taken, his handsome face adorned bedrooms across the land. Now David, if you'd known more about investments, could you have made better use of your money? Yeah. Toy Story 2 on video and DVD. It's playtime.
Call now on 09069 100 600 for a live one-to-one -one chat. 09069 100 600. Mortgages, ISAs, home insurance, unit trusts, car insurance, you name it. To sort out your money, visit virginmoney.com. A racing driver can walk away from a 180 mile an hour crash. Tucker wasn't actually murdered at all. This is your unique doorway to a whole new world. A world that AOL is making simpler, faster, and easier to use for everyone. We are making the world smaller by thinking bigger, opening up new ways for you to communicate so you can be part of a global community of over 25 million members. We can make sure you'll never forget those important dates. And if you want, we'll help you choose the right gifts and even deliver them straight to your door. We'll give you access to the best of everything from wherever you want. And as for the future, just wait until you see what we can do together. Welcome to AOL. Call 0800 237 237 to be part of it. to avoid accidents on Britain's most notorious roads, starting with the country's most dangerous motorway. Accident Black Spot begins Tuesday at 8.30 on 4. Did Channel 4's Words of Fire programme about Salman Rushdie's The Satanic Verses simply reinforce dangerous stereotypes? Right to Reply is next. got a cold sore, don't hide away, treat it with Cervirax. Whether it's a blister or just a tingle, nothing can clear it faster. Cervirax, putting the smile back on your face. If you're single, or even if you're not, you'll always be welcome at the Singles Bar. People call in every day looking to chat, get a date, or perhaps something more. You'll find the Singles Bar on 09062 622 666. And we have thousands of callers every day looking for fun. So why don't you join them on 09062 622 666. Call us now. Antarctica. Even now a challenge for extreme explorers. In 1914, Ernest Shackleton's dream was to be the first to cross this bleak continent. With only the most basic equipment, he and his adventurers pitched themselves against a hostile environment. Ordinary men against the raw forces of nature, testing their endurance to the limit. Endurance, Shackleton and the Antarctic, Thursday at 8 on 4. 
Non, il y a une colère générale par les coureurs depuis... Down, down a bit. Up. Depuis, 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 ok, back where you were. Yep. Bon, left a bit. Right a bit. Oh. Get Rich Quick, the secrets of success on TV game shows. Don't try this at home, TV soap accused of encouraging kids to injure themselves. And watching you, watching them, why TV companies want your personal data. Hello and welcome to Right to Reply, the program where TV viewers confront the TV makers. Tonight, Words of anger about words of fire. Lucy Watson Russ accuses Channel 4 of broadcasting a one sided and inflammatory account of the controversy over Salman Rushdie's The Satanic Verses. Before that, beware of imitations. Siobhan on Channel 5's Family Affairs is cutting herself with razor blades. Is the soap encouraging young viewers to imitate her? Last week, Right to Reply investigated how mental illness was handled on Brookside. This week, another peak time soap is in the firing line. Family Affairs on Channel 5 is currently showing a character cutting herself with razor blades in an effort to cope with mounting stress. Alison Scales is concerned. It's a storyline that could encourage imitation. Self-inflicted injury is a major problem. Recent statistics suggest that as many as 160,000 people a year are admitted to hospital as a result of injuring themselves. It's not surprising then that a soap should choose to focus on this subject. I'm currently studying the subject of self-harm as part of my degree. I'm worried that by showing Siobhan cutting herself, her behaviour could be imitated by vulnerable viewers. I am especially worried by this night. moment that suggests so cutting yourself can me. offer some sort of comfort. How could you do something so stupid? I don't know, all right. It just makes me feel better. The ITC, the commercial TV regulator, recognises that TV has to be careful not to show behaviour that encourages imitation. The portrayal of any dangerous behaviour easily imitated by children should be avoided and must be excluded entirely at times when large numbers of children may be expected to be watching. I don't think that images of people injuring themselves are suitable for the 78,000 children under 16 that regularly watch the show at 6.30 every weeknight. We know that school children will imitate each other's self-damaging behaviour. We have to tread a very difficult balance between talking about these problems openly um, and being conservative in the information that we give. We showed Siobhan with a razor blade, but we didn't see how she inflicted the injury on herself, because that is very definitely not an image that you would want to, to show to children. I don't have any fears that people will imitate her behaviour. She doesn't get any long-term satisfaction from hurting herself. But it's not just children that are vulnerable. The problem of deliberate self-harm is particularly a problem of young women. So that group would be at greatest risk of being influenced by such programs. And we have to remember that Family Affairs is watched by over 109,000 people in this most at-risk category. The reason that we do it is just to show people what it means for somebody to be driven to hurting themselves and hopefully elicit sympathy for that. What we hope is that the emotion behind the situation will lead people to understand why it is that she's doing it. But imitation is not my only concern. From my studies, I know that people are usually reluctant to confess to self-harm. It makes no sense. Dramatic moments like this one, in my view, are unlikely to encourage yeah. people to seek help. It is disgusting. If someone believes that they will get a very hostile, emotionally laden response, then the danger is that will dissuade people from uh, bringing it out into the open. For Pete, Siobhan's husband, to have been completely understanding would have been completely out of character and it would have alienated the audience, I think, because they would have thought this is, you know, um, some kind of diatribe from the Office of Information. But what really makes me question whether family affairs have handled the subject with suitable care is the fact that there has been no helpline following the programmes. I'm not absolutely convinced about the necessity for them. But I have to say, I, 
I wasn't expecting the sort of response that we got to it. And we are having another conversation now about whether it's a good thing. I'm glad that a helpline is being considered. But after speaking to Family Affairs, I'm still not convinced that an early evening soap is the best way to raise awareness of self-harm. If you're concerned about someone who self-harms, there's a Channel 4 recorded information line open round the clock on 0870 400 75. The battle between the big-time game shows intensified this week as Who Wants to Be a Millionaire crowned a £500,000 winner, the first woman to do so. He just won £500,000! BBC One, meanwhile, hit back at its ITV rival with a new peak-time version of The Weakest Link. The show's attracted some controversy by offering the BBC's biggest ever cash prize. BBC bends rules on quiz prizes in battle for ratings. Desperate BBC up the ante. £20,000 is a, a large sum of money, and that's why we took a very carefully considered decision. The prize absolutely, I believe, has to equate with the effort and has to be a reward for the effort and the entertainment that a, a, a person gives you. We asked the 500 Right Replies Internet Survey Group whether they approved of the BBC using licence money to fund big cash prizes. 37% said yes, 63% said no. This is an example of BBC One competing with ITV as if it were a commercial company. It isn't and it shouldn't. It is an abuse of public service broadcasting. Game shows should be left to the commercial channels. As with drama, the more there is at stake, the more compelling it is. So, we also asked the 500 whether the prospect of big winnings made them more inclined to watch the programme. 48% said yes, 14% said no. 38% said it makes no difference, but does it make a difference to the competitors? Big time game shows are all about big money, but you have to go small to win big. Let's face it, whether it's fruit machines or the National Lottery, it's hard to resist the lure of easy money. Which is why, I suppose, contestants queue in their thousands to undergo ritual humiliation and interrogation on the big TV quiz shows. But, according to David Smith, the true secret of game show fame and fortune is to resist temptation. Big money game shows are a big part of modern television. But is this really the best way to get rich quick on TV? I would like to think of myself as a bit of an expert on the subject of game shows. Although I work as a chaplain by day, I sometimes lead a double life. A life of harmless thrills and easy money. Somebody once poured over you accidentally some domestics. <laughs> they got arrested for a breach of the priest. <laughs> well, perhaps not always that easy. Over the last 12 years, I've appeared on 22 TV game shows. I've won all manner of things from a blankety-blank checkbook and pen to a pink jacuzzi for six persons, which I had to give away to charity. So what is the best way to win big on TV? Obviously, you may think it's by appearing on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? I think where the odds are stacked against you is in getting on the programme in the first place. There's so much money at stake, so many other people want to be on that show that you're competing in a very, very big field of runners. So that's where the odds are stacked against you. In my view, they would be tens or possibly hundreds of thousands to one. Meanwhile, on Channel 5's 100%, you could have won £500. On Wheel of Fortune, everything from champagne to fridge freezers were won. The Generation Game had a luxury holiday in Morocco, while friends like these had a five-star trip to Thailand. On The Price is Right, someone won £15,000 worth of prizes. Five years ago, I won £20,000 worth. Add it all up, it's not bad. Overall, in my experience, I would advise anyone that wants to win big to go for lots of lesser-known game shows instead of who wants to be a millionaire. But don't take my word for it. I went to another expert for advice. I am about to come face to face with one of my rivals over the years. Where I've relied on luck, her success comes from sheer brain power. She is the doyen of game show contestants, Daphne Fowler. Which contemplative monastic order was founded in 1084 by St. Bruno? 
the Carthusians. I won the car on sale of the century, I won cash, I won a trip to the Olympics in 1988, which was absolutely brilliant. The day after I got married in 1990, I won £2,000, so that paid for our honeymoon. And Daphne has won big over the years. For example, a series of appearances on sale of the century enabled Daphne to buy a house. I have to say something I've always wanted to ask you. How on earth do you acquire all your general knowledge? I just read voraciously. I mean, now that I'm retired, I've got the time to do it. And, well, you've got to keep your brain in gear, haven't you? That's true. In a nutshell, I'd like to say that in order to win big, you ought to think little. While everyone else is going in for the biggest game shows, why not try for the smaller ones? And one final piece of advice. So you oh, probably no. want to know where you're going. That's true. Oh, we yeah. would. Where are they going? You're going to the Bavagon City. This was the most valuable prize I ever won. Meeting the Pope is a memory I shall cherish forever. At the end of the day, money isn't everything. I watched Words of Fire on Channel 4, hoping it would be an objective account of Muslim reaction to the satanic verses. What I saw was both one-sided and inflammatory. It's now over a decade since this book, The Satanic Verses, was burnt in the streets of Bradford amidst allegations that it was blasphemous to the Muslim religion. Since then, the majority of media attention has focused on its author, Salman Rushdie, the debate over his right to free speech, and, of course, the death threat or fatwa against him. Less attention has been paid, perhaps, to the opinions of Britain's Muslim community. Last Saturday, however, Channel 4 sought to reflect the Muslim perspective of the Rushdie affair in its Untold series. But Lucy Watson-Russ is worried the programme may have backfired. The reaction to Salman Rushdie's satanic verses was a turning point in British relations with Islam. The book was burnt amid accusations of blasphemy, and the author was put under a death sentence known as a fatwa. Words of Fire revisited the controversy. As a teacher, I often see instances of anti-Islamic racism, most of it motivated by ignorance, and I look forward to watching a programme which would educate people about the Muslim community in Britain. In my opinion, what I saw was nothing less than offensive. To my mind, it was a one-sided polemic. There was a range of voices, and there was a lot of dialogue and debate within the Muslim community about the Rushdie affair, and the programme just gave the impression that we all supported the fatwa. One of the programme's interviewees, Yasmin Alibi Brown, recently wrote a newspaper article saying that she did not support the fatwa. Why were these views not represented in the film? Another thing that bothered me was that the programme failed to adequately examine Rushdie's right to freedom of expression. Only Faye Weldon was interviewed to defend Rushdie. I didn't know that people could condemn other people to death simply for thinking or feeling or saying what they believed. One of my most serious objections to the programme was it implied that the anti-Islamic backlash in Britain was solely the responsibility of Salman Rushdie. If the Rushdie wouldn't have done this, I wouldn't have suffered this. What the programme failed to examine was the degree to which the anti-Muslim feeling was a product of a combination of complex factors. The impact of seeing books burnt, of seeing a death sentence against a writer, and for some people, deep-seated institutionalised racism. It was an interesting indication of the overall tone of the programme that despite the fact that Iran has said it will no longer endorse any attempt to carry out the fatwa, there was a hint that Rushdie's life was still potentially in danger. If he were to start uh, living a high-profile life, then the old uh, wounds will again uh, uh, begin to hurt the community. And obviously, uh, then there is always a danger that he may not uh, die a natural life. Words of Fire, for me, has failed to address the genuine issues of institutionalised racism and the debate within the Muslim community. I'm now joined by Lucy Watson-Russ and by Patrick Young, who's the Multicultural Commissioning Editor responsible for Words of Fire. Patrick, what was the programme supposed to be? What were you trying to do? This was a very targeted programme about the event of the publication of the Satanic Verses and the aftermath of that event. It wasn't an attempt to do a general piece about Islam, it wasn't an attempt to try and sort of demystify Islam. It was about that particular event and its aftermath. 
Lucy, granted they were going to make that programme, what do you think was missing? I think the thing that was really missing for me was any kind of moderate Muslim voice. It's very interesting to think of it as a targeted programme looking at one particular event in a lot of detail. But in order to look at one event, surely you have to look at both sides of that event. We did that. I mean, Yasmin Alibi Brown, Zaki Badawi are two noted liberals. But they didn't uh, say within the programme, or certainly I didn't hear them say, that they were opposed to the fatwa, nor did the commentary say that. The commentary made it quite clear that they were opposed to the fatwa but felt backed into a corner. Um, when the controversy was at its height um, in that the liberal establishment so rubbished the Muslim demand for the book to be banned that actually to say t it was very difficult for them to get the space to have that argument but it's quite clear from the context in which they're set that they were opposed to the fatwa. But in Lucy's film you saw the editor of Q News say that a lot of moderate Muslim voices were not heard in the programme. That's the view of the editor of Q News. I mean we've had calls to our duty log from Muslims saying it was a balanced and informative film. Do you think that there's a danger of, um, of repeating the arguments ten years on? You talked at one point in, the, in your film uh, and in the letter you wrote to us about the danger of a backlash. Do you think there really is such a danger? I don't think there's any danger of repeating the arguments. What concerned me was that I still believe that it, there wasn't any truly moderate voice within the programme and by not having that, what you're actually presenting is a very one-sided argument which can then just enhance people's own stereotypes all Muslim people are radicals, all Muslim people support the fatwa. That wasn't the case. But that can actually have a very dangerous effect now, how we actually perceive other people in our own community. But if you take Yasmin Alibi Brown, who I believe was cast as a liberal, she, she described the film in her column as fascinating. Um, if you take Zaki Badawi, who got the final word on the film, he said the whole satanic verses issue had been a catastrophe for British Muslims because it had unleashed Islamophobia in its modern context on, on the Muslim community. When we were talking earlier, you said to me that the, the implication of the programme you thought was that all of the problems were the direct result of this one man and this one book. Do you think that's a bit naive? I think very much that was the implication of the programme. I mean, actually, in the film which we made yesterday, there is the man who was attacked in Bradford saying that had Rushdie not written the book, he would not have been attacked. Another way you could look at that is had a fatwa not been opposed against satanic verses, he would not have been attacked. By saying that the huge Islamophobia is Sam and Rushdie's fault is actually letting most racists completely off the hook. I think the Islamophobia, I mean the first wave was following the book burnings and it was his book that they burned. I mean I don't believe Sam and Rushdie per se is responsible for contemporary Islamophobia. But what we are trying to explore is this event and the reactions of the media and of some Muslims in burning the book certainly did create the, the conditions which have led to the, a large part of modern Islamophobia. I mean, the book burnings were condemned universally in the papers and even by the man who started the campaign. He was appalled by the book burnings. But I think the point perhaps is being made that, you know, that may have been the match, but there's plenty of tinder around and perhaps you should have looked at the net tinder and where that had come from. But most of that tinder which we now think was lying around in a large way before wasn't really there. I mean, the main preoccupation in British media about Muslims pre-Satanic Verses was arranged marriages. After the Satanic Verses, that's where in the paper suddenly all Muslims became fundamentalists. I mean, that's why that montage of newspaper cuttings was there, to show how the paper suddenly rounded on all Muslims. All Muslims became fundamentalists. Lucy, another thing that you mentioned to me you would have liked to have seen was what had happened to the Muslim community since over the last ten years. I think attitudes towards the Muslim community and the Asian community in general haven't changed very much. I think it's very interesting that although the issue has died down in the press, people's attitudes to Asian people in this country haven't changed. I do think it was a pity that wasn't actually discussed in the programme. I think that there's some you know, fairness in that criticism. I mean, we, we did focus heavily on the, the primary event and the, the primary issues around it. We did look at some of the contemporary fallout. Um, you know, those people who still believe the fatwa you know, has value were, were featured in the film. Also, we looked at um, attempts by the Muslim Parliament to try and gain leadership of British Muslims and how that failed. And one of the reasons they failed was people didn't buy their fundamentalist message. I mean, we also talk about the, how the number of mosques has doubled. So we did pick up aspects of, of, of the progression of that community over ten years, but I accept that it wasn't you know, the centrepiece of the film. I think you make a really interesting point there that the Muslim Parliament didn't succeed because it didn't have the support of the rest of the, the Muslim community more moderate liberal voices didn't support it. You've made that point, I agree with you entirely. The programme didn't, though, did it? Uh, I think you'll find Zaki Badawi said that these were the bastard children of Salman Rushdie. 
you know, they jumped into a leadership position, but you know, no one followed them. So, in the end, Lucy, do you think it was a worthwhile venture, or do you still say it shouldn't have been made? I would be very hesitant to say a programme shouldn't have been made, and I did watch the entire thing riveted and very much had a lot to think about from it. I do feel, though, that at the end of the day it was a missed opportunity. I think there could have been a very, very good programme made there, either covering in more depth the actual debate at the time within the Muslim community. There also could have been a very good programme about where the Muslim community is now and what the fallout has been ten years later. Lucy Watson-Russ and Patrick Young, thank you very much. On a shelf or in a computer somewhere, there's a file on all of us, probably several. And it's not just the taxman or doctors who collect data about us. Television companies can too, as broadcasters expand onto the internet, inviting us to use their web pages and email services. They're also developing the ability to build up electronic profiles of our interests and consumer choices. But is our personal data safe? Sandy Buchanan reports. Just imagine if someone followed you every time you went out. They'd know your name, where you're from, what type of things you like to buy. They'd even know your credit card number. Well, when you go onto the internet, that's exactly what can happen. The net used to be the preserve of the few, but now over a quarter of us use it at home. And that number is on the increase because you don't have to buy a computer anymore to get online. TV companies like OnDigital, Granada and NTL are bringing it right into our front rooms through our TV sets. I use the internet a lot, but I find I'm constantly having to hand over personal information. And my worry is, how safe is this information once it leaves my screen and enters cyberspace? The internet is a huge threat to personal privacy. Virtually everything you do on the internet can be transmitted anywhere on the planet, can be used by whoever chooses to use it for whatever purposes. When you register for the net with TV companies like On Digital and NTL, they ask you questions about yourself and reserve the right to use this information for marketing and research. Granada are so keen to get information about you that when they launch their TV internet service with the Power Channel later this year, they are going to give you a free internet box and all you have to do in return is answer a lifestyle questionnaire each month. And answering questions is only the beginning. All your movements can actually be followed on the net. On digital and NTL, as well as media sites like Beeb.com and Sky.com, can keep records of which parts of their sites you visit and what products you buy. Some companies use cookies, which are tiny lumps of information that record data about how you use a website and what your preferences are on that website. Now, it is possible by examining the cookies stored on an individual's machine to work out which sites that they have visited. So, in a way, it is possible to use cookies to follow, to trace a user's path around the web. So why are they so keen to find out about us? As the number of TV channels multiplies, there are fewer viewers watching any particular channel, and advertising is reaching a smaller audience. So TV companies and advertisers are keen to reach us in different ways. If the owner of a website has information about what sort of things you're interested in, how much money you earn, your geographic location, uh, that information can be used to better target adverts towards you. A list of names containing information of a thousand people could be sold for around 250 to 300 pounds. Not all companies sell on data. In the UK, companies can't sell on information about you without your permission. People are legally protected and data is legally protected, but companies aren't always as transparent or as clear about what they're doing with personal data as they should be. 90% of the sites you visit will be within the US. Now there are precious few rules regarding how organizations deal with our personal information. When a website gets your data, when you register for a website, let's say, or, or conduct a transaction, that information can be sold on to whoever pays the highest price. That's the problem we face. There are a few things you can do to protect yourself. First of all, you should look at the privacy policy of any companies that you're dealing with. Secondly, you should take any options which they give you to opt out of junk mail. And thirdly, uh, you should be cautious about uh, companies that might place cookies on your hard disk, and you should use the facilities in your web browser to disable cookies. But it's not all bad news. By collecting data in this way and selling it on to marketing companies, you, for a start you can receive advertising which is much more focused to your personal interests and also by doing this uh, the marketing companies are funding products and services over the internet which otherwise wouldn't be available or would cost a lot of money. 
If you're watching the internet on your TV, you have to be careful. And remember, it may not be as private as you think. You may be the one being watched. That's it from Right to Reply. Until the same time next week, goodbye. Exercise your right to reply by ringing us on 0870 504 4444, emailing us on r2r at channel4.com, or writing to Right to Reply, Channel 4 Television, Horseberry Road, London SW1 P 2 TX. And you can swap views with other viewers on the Channel 4 website at www.channel4.com. In the last decade, one event has triggered national debate. The press tend to vilify what they see as conceptual or obscene, with headlines that are conceptual and obscene. The critics attack and defend it with mutual indignation. The artists usually emigrate to warmer climes. But every year, the public overcrowding of Tate Britain bears witness to its popularity. There are many different perspectives on the Turner Prize, but for 10 years, there's been one consistent point of view. Channel 4, sponsors of the public view. A public view of a week's worth of trans world sport is next tonight here on 4. Call now on 09069 100 600 for a live one to one chat. 09069 100 600. At PC World, we've helped even more people choose a new PC, more than anyone else in Britain. And of course, the more of you who join us, the more we can hammer down on prices. Driving them even lower, right across Britain's biggest range of top-name PCs. That's why you're sure to find the perfect PC for you. That's PC World. It. We work, you play. You might think that you know about events in Africa, but did you know that the charities you gave money to had been duped? Or that millions of Africans are giving up on their continent and heading for Europe? Who'll save Africa? A new season of programs starts with The Hunger Business, Saturday at 8 on 4. Now on for a rugby player who thinks he's a boxer, or is it the other way around? You decide in Trans World Sport. Sport on four with Stepstone Online Recruitment. This week on Trans World Sport. <laughs> Sport on four with Stepstone Online Recruitment. I'm a working parent, and because of the working families tax credit, I get an extra eighty-five pounds a week. As a working loan parent, I get £230 extra every month.
we're working parents and we get an extra £260 per month. We're working parents so we take home an extra £42 a month. If you're a working parent earning £20,000 or less, see if you qualify for Working Families Tax Credit. Call 0800 597 5976. On four with Stepstone Online Recruitment.